I soon realised there were few churches in Aylesbury that believed that the baptism in the Holy Spirit was a distinct experience from being born again. I had no problem with this, as that is how I read the Bible. I actually felt I was baptised in the Spirit when I first believed, and Jesus spoke to me. The only thing I seemed to lack was speaking in tongues. This had not happened. I remember speaking to Mr Sidthorpe, the pastor of the Strict Baptist Church, which was Limes Avenue, about these things, and he gave me an article written by John Stott, who denied the baptism of the Spirit as I knew it. I was amazed at the way these people twisted and wriggled out of what God had plainly spoken about. At that time, I read as much as I could about this experience, because this experience was not recognised by any other group of Christians apart from the Elim Pentecostal churches. The best book that I read at that time was by Derek Prince, called From Jordan to Pentecost. This gave a very clear and biblical position about speaking in tongues and it being the evidence of the baptism of the Spirit. Being converted unto Christ was by no means an outward imposed principle. I was not under any set of rules, I was not under any kind of legal fear to serve God, a rule which says, do this and you'll be okay. There was no rest in works that I could do. It was in fact the rule of faith. It was to walk by faith, without which it was impossible to please God. I was what the scripture described, a new man, with an inward desire to follow the Lord Jesus Christ. The scripture expressed this as God's writing his laws upon the fleshly tables of the heart. Hebrews 8, 10-13 I began to read the Bible straight away, and I read the Good News Bible within two weeks of receiving it, which was a good thing for me, who could hardly read. I was able to understand most of what I read, and thought I understood it all at first. Before this time, I was ignorant of its contents, and very soon the principal points of the gospel became very clear to me. The divine nature, or deity, of Jesus Christ was essential to understand. Hell was real, just as heaven was sure. The actual reality of Adam and Eve, and the fall of our first parents. The need for the shed blood of Jesus Christ to remove sin that salvation was the forgiveness of sins by faith alone, without works done by us. We were not under the law of Moses as the Jews were, but under Christ Jesus, under his rule, by his law, the gospel of love and grace. I remember trying to tell one of my friends about following Jesus, saying that I didn't have to give up anything to become a Christian. I simply found I didn't want to do certain things any more. This lad came up to me, some time after this, and I'm sure he misunderstood me, and in front of several other lads said, Is it right, Dave, you don't have to give up anything to become a Christian? He was expecting my answer to be, No, you can carry on just as you are. However, I said, That's right, you don't have to give up anything except sin. This silenced him, and I think they all got the point. I learned that God's way of saving people was through the preaching of Christ and him crucified and that the new birth was a must. What amazed me was the apparent lack of zeal and knowledge of them that had professed faith in Christ. Also, how these persons tended to try and entertain people by means of music instead of preaching. On the 22nd of May 1972... I was asked to give my testimony at a meeting of people in Luton, about 400 people. I was not sure what the meeting was all about, so I simply spoke as I felt right to do. I spoke the gospel as best I could. I was not fully conversant with the doctrines of grace at that time, but I was soon to learn the word more perfectly. Providentially, this meeting was recorded and may be viewed and listened to on YouTube under the title Converted on LSD Trip, 1972, David Clark. Every day was the Lord's day to me. I awoke, I was conscious of the presence of God, and when I slept, yes, even in my dreams, I knew of no distinctions of days, such as holy days or Sabbath days, for I knew that these be abolished in and fulfilled in Jesus Christ, being the sum and substance of the Mosaic Sabbaths and Sabbath. 
He was the body that cast the shadow of the Mosaic law. Colossians 2, 16-17 The Old Testament Sabbath day prefigured the Gospel day in which the believer rests from impious rebellion and war with his maker, from legal labour for life and from the intolerable burden of sin, as well as an eternal rest from the indwelling of sin in heaven. Quotation from William Huntington Authorised Version of the Bible At the Assemblies of God Church at Rickford Hill, we had a representative from the Trinitarian Barber Society speak. Mr Cyril Bryan confirmed his belief how important it was for us to use a good translation of the Bible. It was pointed out to me that the modern versions often left out or changed the text of Scripture, which clearly taught the deity of Christ. From that time I began to be cautious of new versions and was happy to stick with the authorised version. This was helpful because all the books that I had begun to read from the 17th to the 20th century quoted from the authorised version of Scripture and not modern translations. On another occasion I was attending the Evangelical Meetings at Fleet Street Pentecostal Church and there was an appeal for money to support the young musicians. The man making the appeal was so moving I felt I ought to give all I could. I reached to my pocket and put in the collection plate all the money I had. I was giving it as unto the Lord, and it was needed. I was happy to give. Shortly after this, the same steward who had collected the money came back to me from the front of the meeting hall, speaking and motioning to me with a roll of notes in his hands, saying, Was I aware how much I had given? I said, Yes, that's OK. It was probably about £200, as I was still used to carrying that sort of money around with me in my pocket. That's in 1970. Shortly after this, at another meeting, there was a visiting evangelist, and he too made similar moving appeals for money. I'd also spoken to him about my tattoo on my arm. This was because I regretted having it. He had been saying, if I believed in God and had faith, then it would go away by a miracle. I asked him, would he pray to have it removed? At the same meeting... He went on to appeal for money, with a prophecy saying the Lord had told him that each one had to give from their bank account 10% of all their money and give it to him the next day. It followed by another vision of an accident that was going to take place if it was not done. At the same meeting, he said, there was someone in the meeting that doubted God and that they must get off their seat and come forward that if they didn't, then another warning be issued. I knew because of my previous talks with him, he had me in mind. I then began to think his so-called prophecy and visions were not of God, but generated to control and manoeuvre people like witchcraft. I then opposed this and would have nothing more to do with it. I even went to Mr Eric Connett and informed him that this type of talk and action was not genuine. Mr Connett was a preacher at the church and had some influence and could have helped correct this kind of error. I'll write this for the sake of any who may feel similar pressure from them who say they've had a word from the Lord or the Lord has sent them for not all that is spoken in the name of the Lord is of God. The Lord loves the cheerful giver. The Lord does not need our money. He wants our hearts. All that we have is his, when this is the case. We are stewards of all that we own. I learned, like the Sabbath, there are no Sabbath days. For every day is Sabbath, so with money. There is no tithe of 10%, but all our possessions are the Lord's, not just 10%.